How did the tour to Sambisa affect your relationship with the government when you got back? So <laughs> we actually, we, 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 with the benefit of hindsight, we now realize how, how correct we were when we received a letter from the government um, telling us within 48 hours that they wanted us to go to Sambisa Forest uh, with a team. And we thought, you know, this government, this was a government that, that just a few days before that letter was sent to us <laughs> had put, out, put forward um, some movement that said it was counter movement to our movement. And um, we were stopped from marching. That movement was escorted <laughs> by, the, by the police all the way to the office of the chief of army staff. So it was a, a week of adversarial attacks from the government. And in 48 hours after that, <laughs> we got a letter saying, we're inviting you to go to Samisa Forest, you know? So we thought there is uh, some sinister thing going on here. This is not a, a, a friendly, <laughs> this is not a friendly uh, invitation. So we said, let's document. But when we went to Sambisa Forest, we were quite impressed with the work of the Nigeria Air Force. It was, it was quite a distinguished team of young officers and the leader of the, of the group. And we interacted very well, asked questions, and we found data on the basis of which we could even understand what the whole uh, counterinsurgency and anti-terrorism war was about. We came back our report was public. We, we came clear that, ah, uh, you know, this effort is going to be a long drawn effort. And that there were certain things we found uh, in the, on, on, in the, in the, on the basis of our surveillance and on the basis of the engagement with the Air Force, that th these were the outcomes for us. And these were the issues we wanted government to pay attention to. So we then uh, said to the government that it was very clear to us also that the broader counterinsurgency effort needed to be properly communicated to the citizens. Because that was the period when government was already celebrating that they captured Grand Zero. So for you, the problem, I mean, after you went to Sambisa and came back, for you, you, you thought the problem was a lack of communication, S proper communication about what they have been doing so far. Serious, poor communication and sometimes a lot of contradictions in communication, mm. which then opened the door for suspicion and doubt. So, and then we also talked about the lack of engagement of affected victims. So, for example, the clear case of Chibok girls and their parents, their parents, their families. And then we talked about the internally displaced people. So we said that all of these things, sent them as our, you know, post-visit report to the government. We were very constructive. People who read our report said, wow, you were very analytical and constructive in this. <laughs> but guess what? <laughs> what we got was insult. <laughs> the like two days after we sent in the report, the Minister of Information <laughs> said to us, if you want to be politicians, be politicians. Oh, and for a number of people, happened? that's what they're saying now. I mean, with, with the launch of this new movement, mm -hmm. they're asking, are you going to run for political office? Are you going to offer yourself up for any political office? I am thinking about it. <laughs> that's a good one. I'm just wondering now, let me, let's go to your time at the World Bank. We're almost out of time now. You worked at an institution that consists of 180 member countries whose aim is to help reduce extreme poverty. But you're aware that in places like Nigeria, you know, a lot of people still view that organization with a lot of suspicion. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with people who, you know, deal with you with some amount of hostility when, mm. you know, you talk about the World Bank and its efforts, for instance? Yeah. You know, there, there are reasons. There are very legitimate reasons for, um, especially on the continent of Africa, for people to have almost a love-hate relationship with the World Bank. Um, and one major one was that for many decades, while the continent struggled with 
the same issue of poor governance, especially when we had aberrant military rule, despotic governments, quasi-democracies or pseudo-democracies. You really didn't have an openness and transparency uh, in relationships that they had with international financial institutions. And they were often not governments that um, had the best of people around the table making decisions. And so what would happen is if they um, engaged with um, the World Bank or the IMF or such organizations and they didn't have a very sound program of their own, they, 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 the staffers of the World Bank can decide a program and they would accept it because they just want to be able to get some money, right? So over the years, you saw in places like DRC, even in places like Nigeria, a ratcheting up of debt that you know, accumulated, but people couldn't see the projects. Now, that particular World Bank is also the World Bank that's associated with the Structural Adjustment Program, SAP. which uh, SAP, which a lot, you know, in, in many ways, uh, some components of it were very good. Uh, they helped the whole um, fiscal discipline that we were struggling with as a continent. It helped us significantly. But there are structural and institutional aspects of it that fell short because they didn't have a political economy understanding of the context in which they were engaging with these countries. That particular, uh, those issues were there. By the time I was at the bank, one of the things we did was to change the dynamics of the relationship between Africa. Instead of African countries being considered as recipients of World Bank support, we moved them into, say, into, we moved into seeing them as partners. Mm. We, so partnership became number one. And it wasn't a change of nomenclature? No, no, no. It was real. Uh, the Africa uh, strategy that I left uh, behind uh, uh, after my time at the World Bank, when, when people, the most intellectual of people on the continent who engaged in the process, when they read the document, they feel a sense of, eh, this, this finally does it. Because part of what helped China and India, which are, were major recipients of World Bank knowledge and finance and partnership, was the, was the fact that there was a dignified relationship. It was, there was no, no kind of uh, misalignment of, of goals. Uh, the, the Chinese or the Indians were very clear as to what their vision was. Mm. And so what they did not need from the World Bank, they did not take from the World Bank. So we tried to change that so that we could elevate the kind of engagement that African countries would have with the World Bank. Mm.